You guys have the Miss America music? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Yes. Oh. Can you turn up the far light? Yes. And <laughs> Ali, 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 that would be a good time to like, get off screen. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>
So there's no doubt that there is great that there are great benefits to getting your genome sequenced, such as the ability to trace your ancestry, as well as the opportunity to realize your potential health risks and take um, necessary precautions if those exist. However, there are also a ton of underemphasized repercussions. Um, getting your genome sequenced has the ability to entirely alter your personal life if you find out you have an uncurable disease or a genetic disease. And even if you do donate your genetic information anonymously, it does not always stay that way. Um, in, in addition, companies such as 23andMe, we found out upon further research, have ulterior motives, kind of, of selling, their, selling your personal genetic information to larger, larger pharmaceutical companies. Therefore, although there is the potential for both private and public health benefits upon G, uh, sequencing your genome, we realized it wasn't necessarily our place to tell people if they should get tested, or if they should um, test their genome. Therefore, we decided instead to formulate um, a project in which we could start a dialogue and discussion around this uh, topic of personal genomics. Yeah, so um, I'm talking about why you chose to use the point. Um, Lizzie Crouch, a science television producer, blog, science produces facts that go to the head. Art produces beautiful, beautiful things that mainly go to the heart. And if you want to influence people, you can influence the head. But if you want them to act, you really have to go through the heart. So that, with that sentiment in mind, we decided to go through the heart. Especially since, as a bulk of the times have decreased in sort of movement. Um, so science is often thought of as a methodical, emotionless realm. In contrast, art is considered an almost purely emotional experience. Bioethics synthesizes human emotion and conscience with the impenetrable facts of science. These three areas of study are rarely used in conjunction. However, each has the power to contribute to and illuminate to the others. Um, our science and ethical questions are therefore intimately connected. Science can inspire ethical questions and art pieces that draw upon the topics at hand uh, and inspire questioning in spectators. Uh, art in, in turn inspires uh, interest in learning about science and a deeper exploration into the ethical questions at hand. Artists can take a complex, distant topic and render it approachable, understandable, interactive even. Uh, when it comes to microscopic processes, such as those taking place around and in the human genome, processes that are immensely difficult to comprehend simply because you can't visualize what's going on, uh, art seems to be the most fitting and relevant tool. Therefore, we decided that art was the best, most direct way to inspire questions and thoughts surrounding the complex territory of personal genomics. By including a range of topics and opinions, all stemming from the themes we designated at the beginning of our project, um, we hoped to uh, uh, provide the viewer with a portal through which to learn about and explore their own opinions of the topics at hand. And so to tie it up, um, Nora will talk a little bit about the connection with Anne Merchant shortly. But um, Anne Merchant, who is the Director of Communications at the National Academy of Science and um, Director of the Science and Entertainment Exchange, uh, told us yesterday that the reason she does what she does, again, Nora will explain shortly, um, is that because art and media are a form of accidental curriculum, um, the connecting tissue between you know, science and knowledge. So, so we were lucky enough to be able to partner with Maggie Little here and Laura Bishop in the Kennedy Institute of Ethics already ongoing showcase. So this gave us the publicity, the location, the audience, things that we could not have secured on our own through this project. So we were able to reach a great, we, were, we had a greater scope going through the Kennedy Institute than we could have on our own. So our first, um, instinct was to contact artists who deal in this realm of personal genomics and curate art that already exists. But we unfortunately did not have the means of transporting art or the legal backing for liability if anything happened. So instead we decided to send out a call to artists, which you can find in the papers we passed out, uh, to local universities and to one high school in the area. Uh, we sent it to all of the art departments, as well as art history, um, music departments, looking for students who were willing to submit, to create and submit art um, surrounding our themes of the showcase. We received some positive feedback.
feedback from professors as well as some realistic feedback that we gave these students a very short time constraint to work in. And so we received a few pieces. Most of them we were not really able to use. One, however, is featured here. It's the interview that you saw over there by a girl at Catholic University in DC. Um, so this left us with having to develop our own art, which as students who are in science classes and rhetoric, we were kind of terrified of that. <laughs> but um, with our own work, we were able to touch on uh, topics of privacy, public health benefits, the future of genomics, um, modes through which you can donate, and then potential risks that surround every form of donation out there. Um, so we mentioned the great things about working with the KIE, with publicity, but one thing about working with a partner who has more experience and more clout in the area that you do than you do is that you must work under their constraints and not necessarily your own. So we, when we first had our exhibit in the, in the bioethics library on the first day, our pieces were grouped together and in their own little section, so you could clearly tell that they were kind of part of one gallery. And then as we moved to ICC, there was an issue that people were going immediately to our pieces. So Laura wanted our pieces to be spread out throughout the gallery to draw attention in all directions. And we thought this really spoke volumes about the power of art as an engaging and quick way to transmit information over just reading a science article or science paper. And so this also led to some problems with our marble experiment because there was no clear beginning and end in which if you noticed our questions were intended to gauge your, uh, gauge your opinion before and after you went through the exhibit. So we do have kind of skewed data on that end. Um, so also next time we plan to, if we continue this, we plan to change the question because it was also skewed in itself. It asked if you would donate for public health reasons, but there are various ways through which you can donate through commercial means, through just medical means, getting back your own information. So we, we would have to tailor our question if we wish to continue with the marbles. And so the positive feedback of our showcase uh, was wonderful. We had a lot of people talk to us afterwards. We had a lot of people write notes in the guest book, but we realized that we were limited to a very specific audience here at Georgetown. And so we have hopes to expand our message and our mission. Yeah, so one way we're working to expand this mission to the greater public right now is to curate already existing art, as we initially wanted to do, into a coffee table art book. So currently we're in the process of formulating this art book. Ideally, it, it, there would have been a prototype of the art book today. Yeah, and they, let me just interject that they have, we're totally on track to do that until one of them was concussed, which is the second semester that's happened at the end of two years. Yes. We'll get concussions here. <laughs> so that one is that is officially excused. The doctor's noted. It's like a sleeping team or something. Don't worry about it. Football, yes, custody, right back in the game. Yeah, right back in the game. Contemporary art in San Diego, so 
most of these pieces are pieces by credible artists. And sorry, the um, ones here are ones you have received permission, or you're yeah, still waiting for some? So there's one in there that we're still waiting permission. That one we're still waiting permission. Did so, yeah, so currently we have about 24 to 28 images. Um, and this is a, a spread right here, so that's two different pages, so open oh. that. Um, is that just filler text in there? Yes. I have an art book, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so there are still a couple of pending permissions because Ooh. some of the art we, were, or art we were interested in was published in magazines such as, or newspapers such as the Wall Street Journal, and so that's very multi-step process in contacting multiple people. Um, but currently we have images of paint, paintings, stills from the documentary In the Family by Joanna Rednick, um, pictures of quilts about, from a woman who takes genetic code and makes quilts um, for people to contact her, as well as our own art that we're planning to publish in the book. And our plan is to print 20 copies by May 6th to turn one in with the final project. And then there also has been great interest in the artists we requested permission from, as well as the museums we requested permission from, um, to send them an art book once it is done. And also, I've been in contact with uh, Miss France Roxy from the Roxy. Institute. Yes. Um, and she Roxy. would be very happy to have one in the Bioethics Research Library downstairs. So we've got some great feedback about people who would be interested in the art book. So that's one of the ways we're trying to get the greater public involved in this initiative. Can we hear from the edits that too? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Initially, we decided that the best route 
months ago during our when we presented for our first crit was to get the greater public involved in donating their genetic information for these public initiatives. Um, however, when we researched further, we became really interested into the kind of backside of 23andMe and all the commercial companies mm -hmm. and what their motives were for the $99 you pay mm -hmm. to get the kit and get your genetic information tested. And so I think that is one reason why we decided that if we were to do this again at the National Academy of Science, we definitely want to um, rewrite that question we asked regarding the marbles because we realized in the end that although that was our first thought of what we wanted to do, that it didn't necessarily align with the pieces that were actually created. Okay, that's great. And then, Lena, uh, do you want to say something? Say, yeah, um, so I think we also uh, wanted to be able to reach out or at least um, access as many people as possible. And 23 and me is something that's in the media, so a lot of people have heard about it. So something that could be understood a little right. bit more. Um, also, uh, and just to be clear, I don't have any problem with you doing yeah. one or both. Mm -hmm. It's just yeah. mixing yeah. them together without yeah. making clear the distinction. Oh, yeah. Um, I think also just because the whole realm is so vague to people, we figured that um, we should talk about 23 me as a separate entity from the donation, which I guess you're bringing yeah. up. Um, because in theory, all the privacy issues with donating your DNA at the a member of the national cohort should there should be all the like uh, marketing and you know. Well, there's also not the worry about being misled about yeah. some information about you because you won't probably get information back yeah. out of you. Um, okay, and then the other broader question, I'll just first parking the. I wouldn't oversimplify the head art, science art thing, but you did a nice job of presenting it. But the but on the. Um, so how did your own views for each? How did your own views of this use of personal genomics, either the um, giving to a federal project or using a kit like 23andMe, change during this project? Well, for me, in the beginning, we all got the opportunity just because of our project to use one of the 23andMe kits they had here for us, and we all were able to use it. And I, in the beginning, for example, was like, yes, like I want to know everything that I can be like predisposed to because I'm sort of a hypochondriac when it comes to those things. Like I'm gonna be like get ahead and like. And then once I started researching, for it's this like project, overkill for hypochondriac. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> once I started researching for everything and all the issues involved, I actually decided not to um, send my kit. I just left it in the lab and because. I realized actually what all the issues that can be involved. Like, what if I find something that can't be cured, and then I have to grab, how do I deal with knowing that I have that for the rest of my life? Or like, what if I someone finds my information and says like, no, you can't work here, no, you can't have life insurance because it's not covered by the Gina Act of 2008. So I just decided Great. not to do it. That's where Let's just go through the. Um, yeah, leaving in the lab. <laughs> That'd be the way to do that then, but yeah. But, uh, yeah, so it's actually kind of interesting how we're seated because um, my views are the same as Valeria's. So during our bioethics course, we actually delve into this topic greatly. And initially, I was very intrigued by the idea of taking or er, participating in 23andMe. And then through the readings, such as we had to write a paper even on um, work, like, somebody whose genetic information got on Facebook, and then how their employer was able to take that and possibly use it against them. Um, so circumstances such as that, as well as even my own well-being about worrying if I have a 10% greater risk of getting this one disease, I decided that I also did not want to participate. Um, so I sent mine in, but what I did is I did not follow the instructions that say register before you send it in. <laughs> and so after I dropped it in the mailbox, I went home to register and realized that the registration code is on the spit tube inside. <laughs> so first I was very oh, angry because that's like a hundred dollar kit. I was very excited to try it out. And then after two or three weeks, I started thinking of my, my biggest fear as I thought about it was that you can you can opt out of giving permission for your name to be attached to your DNA. And so your anonymized information can still be sold to companies.
but as more people use 23andMe or as more people are entered into these data banks, you could, your personal information could be easily linked to someone else who's in the, one of these data banks and all of your personal info could be found. You could be targeted for personalized medicine. And so we need our algorithm to cross, cross match it with the about and honest journal. So. Oh, and I was kind of relieved that I messed up the process. <laughs> <laughs> Is this the kit? Do you owe us $100? <laughs> no, like, you were surprised how many students did that last semester, too. <laughs> like, half our class last semester like patched up the stuff and sent it out even though we told them and like to yeah. register I, first and follow the instructions who just did not read the instructions. <laughs> Maybe that's a genetic problem. <laughs> <laughs> right, well I, I did send my name. I haven't got my results back, but I registered and sent my name, so I'll get it back soon. But also I think when we realized how much of a variety there was just within our group on whether or not we wanted to send it in or test it, that's when we kind of switched from advocating for everybody to donate their genomes, realizing, oh, we just should just raise these questions, make people at least prepared to donate if they wanted to, because they thought about the questions. But also, I joined this group the second week, and um, and when I came in, you guys were like, oh, doing genetics. And I was like, genetics, what? But, oh, but so <laughs> I, you know, over the course of the semester, I learned so much and realized how this is, this is the next technology that's just accelerating so fast. So, yeah, so, yeah. 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 so I actually had done 23 me before the FDA shut down, like the you know results showing. So, so let's just pause and talk about that a second. Yeah. Since you know that. Yeah. So so if you get 23 me now, yes. do you get any help results? You back? do not. You so why does it say you do your installation? Because you, you do have some. Rocka. Either so you can get the Raka, exactly. Um, which you, you can what? then raw data, oh, okay. which you can then of course easily Google and figure out, you know, this sequence corresponds with this trait or this help. I understand that, but this says 23 and you will give you health results. I think it's I think our intention was to <laughs> raw data and it just came across a little jump hole. There are other companies like personal like Nemogenics or uh, Path Path something that do the same services like 23 and me, but that just have it been but the direct to consumer, mm -hmm. as opposed to those that go through a medical professional, mm -hmm. are not allowed by the FDA mm -hmm. to give out health information. That's not the impression you get reading mm -hmm. that installation. So it's mildly misleading. Mm -hmm. So you just want to be, especially yeah. as I think if you, well, in general, boo boo. Yeah. You're not supposed to do that if you spend a semester on genetics, and you knew that about this, right? But also, if you're thinking of doing an installation for scientists around, this has to be, yeah. you know, for credibility, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think we were thinking that because it's so easy to take raw data and find the traits that correspond with it, that, well, which we haven't done ourselves. You can say that it works, actually. That would be interesting. Yes, but, but let's also be honest. The, the worry that you were highlighting, which was a worry back in 23 and Health, mm -hmm. is that you're excited so you do the spit test, and you get back scary information. Mm -hmm. That's very different than getting back raw data and then being one of the 1% of people who know that there's already used databases out there that you can go and then figure it all out. That's not the objection that you're representing there. Because you're not against people doing hard work to find out their health information at all. What you were object worrying about is people who do it or this sounds exciting and then get, whoa, that I'm, I'm at double the risk of whatever. So the fact that you get raw data back and could is not at all the same. Yeah, for sure. I think also that, that was one of the issues that our issue, or like at least my worry with 23andMe was the fact that upon reading their privacy letter, they do have like a lot of real issues with the company, like the right to sell your data to other companies, or like if a company is bought by another company, your data is transferred. No, absolutely. So that privacy, that was a different thing. Mm -hmm. Going on with that, this is, uh, uh, oh, yeah, finish, I forgot, I don't know, finish your thing. Um, so anyway, I was saying I got it, you know, two and a half years ago, um, mostly because my mom encouraged me to, because she's like a genealogy nut, uh, but also because I'm an identical twin, I have a little brother with a severe genetic disorder, 
I've, uh, an older sister who was raised in different households. So my entire like upbringing has been a pseudo like genetic experiment. And so I thought it would be really cool. I mean, it really has. Like twin studies, my brother is deletion positive disorder. Like all these things really cool. So. Um, in a way, all of us live a pseudo genetic yeah, <laughs> experiment. Really but anyway. Yeah. But so I did it with no reservations and um, got my health information back and you know. Admittedly, didn't learn anything that was like earth shattering, so not all that affected by it. I have a higher propensity for gout, so I'll avoid like a go. lot of rich foods, I guess. Avoid the 18th but, century. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know, I know. Okay. <laughs> it does. Can I ask one thing on that? And then I'll just go on to others. But just why, why did you do, even, even that you had those real family reasons, why did you go through 23andMe instead of? Some more medical. Yeah, good question. I think because it was so easy, like readily available and accessible, you know, and a lot cheaper. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. Sure it's and like we, I, yeah. Um, so that's again, my opinion has not changed. If anything, it's actually probably tended towards more supportive of personal genomics. I also have taken um, like genomics and bioinformatics as part of my major, and so I learned all about how you access this information, and it's really cool. It's a very cool emerging field that is hard to understand, just like you have to understand how to use all these databases. But um, I don't know, I just think it's like a fascinating, exciting field that should be more valued. And then as a side note, my deaf twin sister sent in her thing for me right after FDA. Shut down. So, but now she knows all information. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Can I ask another question? Um, on the piece that's called the interview, mm -hmm. one of you, I think it was you, mentioned Gina, the mm -hmm. non-discrimination act. So, tell me your understanding of what Gina says about that scenario with the interview. Where originally, once this field emerged, there were worries that employers are going to use this information. chance of heart disease that they would be like, oh, I'm sorry, like, you can't play for us anymore. So in 2008, I believe the uh, genetic non-discrimination, the genetic information non-discrimination act was passed in which they said that employers or regular insurance can't discriminate upon your genetic information. But the fact is that it excludes life insurance and something else. And small companies. So that's you, so, good, good job. Yeah. That, it's like, that piece like just explores like it's a an interview basically, and if you look at like the resume, it shows the genetic information and just to demonstrate in a way how in the future what if like on your resume you have to put like your predisposition and stuff like. Yeah. Sure. No, I, I I love the piece. Mm -hmm. It's another example where I think the the thematizing text accompanying might benefit from another round of, of thoughtfulness because you don't want to spread misinformation or misimpressions. It's not like you're literally not the best. The 23 and me, you're misinformed mm -hmm. people. But that one, part of what you'd like to do is give people context, right? It's not just that it could just be there is a very important law in place that has some holes in it. Every non-discrimination law has some holes in it. Okay. Actually it's a very good law. Okay. But yeah, you should know about that. But but we wouldn't want people to get you would want to give the impression that it's just you know the wild west in terms of privacy and genetics because that's anti. You want to help people be literate on personal genomics. Do you see what I mean? Especially since it's like a decade to pass that law. Also, just a side note to that: we did consider putting more information on the thing, but because it was a gallery and an art. So this is exact. Sorry, it's like and then I'll click. But, but I would just want to name that that's your challenge. Mm -hmm. You need to embrace that. Because you're absolutely right. The answer to, to what I just said is not to, here's you know a, a full footnoted set of information and it should be now. But, but that is exactly what the challenge of curating an art show to create an impression. Very few words to get across good, deep context understanding. And that, so, so embrace it and lean into that. That's fun. Don't deal with it by making the type smaller. <laughs> <laughs> to pick up exactly on the four things you left off, um, I have three quick things, and two of them are really complimentary, right? So one, I, 
one of you already mentioned something like this, but I, I think we should all give you a lot of credit for starting with one very specific intention or direction and message and having the research turn you in a different direction. Yeah. That pivot is like exactly what should be happening in this kind of work. And I'm not sure it's happened for other groups. <laughs> uh, that's huge, and like, I just give you a lot of credit for it. Number two, the first question I remember when we started talking was why art, but you did directly address it. Now, depending on where you are and what your field is, like you may have an affinity for your answer, uh, more or less, right? Personally, I adore it. I go to Holy Man the theater a lot, and their lobbies are full of this sort of show about social issues. Um, it's a thing, I think it works really well. Number three, this is like the not in love with comment, <laughs> right? So it's about the writing, basically. Um, and as the, the writing rhetorician guy, I'm gonna riff just for a second on this. Um, like it stands out, like the book looks like it's gonna be actually amazing, right? But there's like no writing <laughs> in the book as it stands right now. Like you, there's a lot of stuff you can do. You can source it from the artists, you can source it from the museums that did the original shows. But the same issue that applies to this stuff applies over here too. Um, I'm happy to help, right? Like it's, it's crucial though, right? I don't know, I don't know, maybe because of what I do for a living. Like when I go to a gallery show, I read as much as I look at the pieces. Um, and it's a big deal. I think that's something we're still debating on whether to source from the artist. Sure. Yeah. But give them the opportunity. And if they want it, let them happen. If they turn it down, then it's up to you guys. That's an opportunity. Yeah, I think that's enough. Yeah. But thank you for your offer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, and then also, this one is the that I included if the, the plans for the art book also included in that um, a timeline of personal genomics and all the different initiatives awesome. and whatnot, as well as further readings and research that people can do in case they're more interested in the field. That's great. What do you think about? So, uh, so thank you. So I gotta admit, I, I, I am every bit the physicist geek that I, I, you propose this idea as a, uh, all right, fine. <laughs> you know, I went into this collaboration with my colleagues thinking I wanted to expand the view of civic engagement, but art, come on. <laughs> uh, wonderful. I mean, it's, it's great that you're getting input that you are about some of the specifics, but, uh, but let me just generalize and say we think really well done. I mean, I'm impressive. This was intended as a pilot just to smooth things out, learn from it as you are with this feedback so that you can then take it to a larger audience. Not just a larger audience, the gold standard of science, which is the academy. I'm, I'm delighted to hear that Ann Merchant was so willing to help. Um, so now let's be even more ambitious. So the you know, first step was testing the idea. The second step was see if you could get somebody like the academy to buy. That's happened. You should start thinking about the next step, which is how do you go after the academy <laughs> to other places too, and I'm happy to talk about how that can happen as well. And just a question. So, how many of you are going to be on campus next fall? And are you interested in continuing this project? Okay. Yeah, I also, speaking of emerging um, children, I'm not going to be around, but I'm happy to continue working remotely. Good. Good. If I can just really, really quickly, I also think that might apply to the book. I want to reserve judgment until I see it. The, a draft of it, but there could be bigger things that you could do with that book beyond 20 copies. So, and I'm happy to follow up on that as well. There are many. So I talked to MIT, a friend at MIT Press, and asked if they'd be interested in it. Um, because it's like it's all time, they're very interested in it. Um, that said, like, I I didn't hear, but just to it, Matt offered to help, right? And like, we have stuff through, stuff we've done through Ethics Lab, and I've been wanting to beef up the studio Press. So either MIT Press or our so own Mason Press. We, we need to end uh, to keep our schedule going, but I do yeah. want to just say one thing it, about expanding to that. You have to revisit copyright completely. Mm -hmm. So, okay. But you know the person to go talk to, but you'll have to get another layer of permission from the artist if you do that. And that was also the 20 month limit was because that's yeah. that should be Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm just saying there may be other opportunities. Yeah. 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 Yeah.